Facebook Live. It's preparing. It's preparing. Oh, yeah. Hey, we are now streaming live on YouTube. Fantastic. My name is Krista Bailey. I am the lucky instructor in sustainability studies at IU South Bend. And tonight we are going to hear from our practicum students. These are the folks that are finishing their degree program. They're majoring or minoring in sustainability studies. They've been working many semesters learning about sustainability, what that is, how it happens, how to do it. Tonight, they are going to be sharing their final projects that they have been developing this semester. These are group projects because sustainability happens in a collaborative fashion. So you'll be hearing the work that they did together to raise awareness about an issue that they have seen on our campus and in our community to develop some baseline data about what the scope is of that issue. They've created some pretty compelling uh, visions and ideas about what life could be like if this was no longer an issue. And they've outlined some action steps to help put this into practice. Uh, and they'll be able to uh, evaluate the success of that as well. So uh, as they got ready to do this project, they looked at uh, their own strengths and abilities. We reviewed a lot of the content that they've been learning uh, in their other courses and uh, pulled all of those together, their skills, their knowledge, their self-awareness, and work together with their teams to make all this happen. So I'm gonna stop talking until the end. We've got two group presentations. Uh, I'm sure they will raise some questions for you about what they're talking about to clarify some things. Why did they do it this way? Uh, what their inspiration was, what they might do next with this information. Um, We'll take those questions at the end. So we've got two uh, presentations coming up. The first is from, uh, both groups are four students each. First, we're gonna hear from Cassidy, David, Jeff, and Hannah. So I am going to turn it over. I believe Jeff is going to share some images in the screen and they'll tell you what they've been working on. So Jeff, take it away. You see Hello. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Cassidy Parks. Um, I'm currently studying sustainability with a minor in anthropology at IUSB South Bend. Oh, my God. Indiana University South Bend. I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. Um, so our presentation's name is Green Restaurants in South Bend, a proposal for a cleaner future. And I will let my fellow group members introduce themselves as well, starting with Jeff. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Clapp. I'm also a sustainability studies major at IUSB um, and I also have a minor in business administration. No. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I'm majoring in sustainability with a minor in environmental studies. Hello everyone, my name is David Hawkins. I am also a sustainability major with a minor in film studies. So when we first think of our climate crisis, many do not first think of the restaurant industry or its impact on our environment. The reality is the restaurant industry has one of the biggest impacts on climate change. Among local restaurants, there is not a unified focus on the threats of climate change in this industry. In response to this challenge, our team will propose a solution to lessen the effects of climate change produced by the restaurant industry. By understanding this relation between restaurants and their environmental impact, we are able to develop the best approach to this issue. So specifically, we will promote the implementation of green restaurant certifications in local restaurants. The certification standards reflect 29 years of research in the field of restaurants and the environment. The purpose of these standards is to provide a clear way to measure restaurants' environmental accomplishments and also create a pathway for restaurants to take action in sustainability. In this presentation, we will propose the concept to our community partner, Eat Drink, Downtown South Bend, by addressing the current 
realities of climate change and how restaurant operations heighten those effects. I, we will now hear from David. The food and restaurant industry has been a major contributor to climate change for many factors as food makes its journey to each restaurant. It is reported by the GRA that a single mid-sized restaurant can produce 100,000 pounds of garbage annually. To go along with that, in her thesis on restaurants and climate change, Rouse states that $161 billion is wasted on uneaten food in the restaurant industry. This causes a dramatic increase in the emissions of methane, a greenhouse gas released from food, which is 21 times more harmful than carbon dioxide to our environment. We can implement ways to combat this issue in the industry as there are alternatives. This requires immediate action, however, as we face a time where inaction has been dangerously acceptable. Next slide, please. In recent decades and ever increasingly as humanity faces the global climate crisis, there has been efforts to reduce the amount of concentrations of substances produced by society by enforcing bans on things like single-use plastics, which are abundant in the food industry. The United States so far has put forth environmental, environmental legislation at the state level, setting bans and mandates on things such as polystyrene foam, recycling, composting that affect the restaurant industry. This currently includes mandatory recycling and composting laws in California, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. New York and North Carolina also have statewide mandatory recycling laws with individual cities like Seattle also following suit. Maine has a statewide ban on polystyrene foam, which is typically used for takeout containers. Some regions have taken this further like San Francisco, which has enacted a expanded polystyrene ban. This is a requirement that all takeout food packaging be recyclable or compostable. While this can be seen as an upcoming hurdle to many businesses, and it may seem easier to comply with the lowest environmental standards at first, it is also a great opportunity to adhere to the strictest standards to gain advantages and to think of new ways to operate that better serve the people on the planet. Adhering to new or upcoming legislations well ahead of time will help to negate any penalties when they are enforced. Additionally, as businesses look for GRA certification, one of the criteria to receive points, as Cassidy will mention later on, is in reusables and environmentally preferable disposables. Having items in place such as biodegradable, reusable, or recyclable materials for things such as takeout containers, utensils, and bags will contribute positively to sustainability efforts, as well as the greening of restaurants and aligning with any forthcoming environmental legislations. Next slide, please. Throughout 2020 and up until now, as we continue to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, which shook the globe and caused serious problems for all of us um, in many aspects of daily life. This food and the food industry in particular uh, suffered greatly, especially our local businesses. As lockdowns were enforced, many dining options were closed completely to customers, making carryout and delivery over the past year become sort of the new normal. This has created m major implications and fallout for the environment. As single use plastics and polystyrene foam used for takeout and delivery increased dramat dramatically. At the same time, reusable and zero waste options, is, options for businesses have halted as well. As things slowly return back to normal, um, as things slowly start to return back to normal, one way that the GRA is using this to increase sustainability is through a partnership with Grubhub, a food delivery service. This includes a campaign to dramatically reduce the number of single use plastics that enter the environment. In a recent uh, press release from Grubhub, they state that in the coming months, the Grubhub app and website will begin automatically defaulting to select zero utensils and napkins with every order. The increase of single-use plastics is not only a top concern for consumers, but this small significant change will generate significant savings for restaurants across the country. So this partnership is also focused on helping restaurants become GRA certified and can help be a great use for the local restaurants here in South Bend. This could be a critical tool for our local businesses to take advantage of as many operations have already used Grubhub to sustain their businesses throughout the pandemic. I'm gonna pass it on to Cassidy. The Green Restaurant Association has developed eight environmental categories that their certification standards lie upon. 
Um, those eight are water efficiency, waste reduction or recycling, sustainable durable goods and building materials, sustainable food, energy, reusable and environmental, environmentally preferable disposables, chemical and pollution reduction, and lastly, transparency and education. Depending on how well the restaurants do, they can be ranked on a scale of one to five. Um, this certification is easily implemented in five steps as well. So first, the GR, GRA gathers the data on the individual restaurants to identify what the GRA, standal, what GRA standards are being followed. Next, the GRA will evaluate the restaurant and will make recommendations based upon financial savings, um, ease of implementation, and environmental impact. Third, the GRA will provide a detailed list of solutions for the restaurant in order to meet the certification standards. Then the GRA will reevaluate the restaurant, making sure those solutions have been implemented in order to reach the certification. And lastly, the GRA will ensure the staff is educated on the certification and will provide these restaurants with social media specialists. Um, these specialists will promote the restaurant and also highlight the environmental steps that these restaurants have taken. The green restaurant certification also has a section for employees, which is um, only a fee of $20. Um, the Green Restaurant Accredited Employee Program, um, hyphen, um, it's in parentheses, so it's like G-R-A-E -E, um, is what it's. Program informs the employee and helps shift the industry towards environmental sustainability. This certification requires the employee to take a 39 question quiz, which will certify them if they score at least a 35. Um, the GRAE is especially significant to ensuring a restaurant can maintain its certification standards. With definite op employee involvement, the restaurant is less likely to encounter barriers in further greening their operations. Having these employees on board through the process goes a long way to ensuring success, but not only for the green operations. Um, it kind of helps the business as a whole. Um, next slide. Um, these are the certification requirements, and as David mentioned before, you can see right at the top, one of the first standard requirements is no uh, polystyrene foam, um, but it's pretty easily outlined there. You can do next slide. Our compelling vision focuses on green dining in South Bend. Specifically, if all restaurants were GRA certified in the city, then restaurant industries will no longer be main contributors of climate change. Also value will be placed on sustainability standards that the GRA holds, such as water, waste, energy, and education. Community members will be intrigued with South Bend's consideration for the planet, people, and prosperity. This will ultimately increase customers' desire to give their business to these restaurants, which is especially important during difficult and unprecedented times. If all restaurants were certified, the GRA certified community will reinforce South Bend's goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Overall, GRA certified restaurants will be environmental leaders in green operations, community engagement and carbon neutrality. Next slide. Our down to action plan embraces implementing green restaurant certification. So calling out to eat, drink downtown South Bend, we propose they implement and advocate the GRA certification. With their strong network in the food and dining industry, it will easily facilitate the message, whether that be a GRA link on their website, sharing GRA benefits on social media, or simply just educating local restaurants. As we've spread the word out to some restaurants, they are eager for this initiative. So it's important to start now to maintain their interest. With short-term goals and quicker results, it's going to be the most beneficial to those that are already practicing green operations. This will allow them to easily score on certain standards. However, it also presents them an opportunity to incorporate ideas they may have never considered before. As our goal embraces all restaurants to be certified, the ones not practicing green operations will be handled during the long run. These ones that aren't practicing sustainability will be influenced by the attention given to those that are. This will encourage them to take a second look at how they currently operate. 
As this all green South Bend restaurant operations, it will also boost Eat Drinks networking base as more businesses will reach out to them. They can also enhance some of their campaigns by featuring segments of GRA certified restaurants, such as during their restaurant weeks that they have. In terms of an alter alternative option, there is no other selection that would lessen the environmental impact that the restaurant industry generates. Simply saying that restaurants should be sustainable and approaching some green practices here and there is not enough. To reduce our restaurant industry's footprint, GRA certification is the most optimal solution in fulfilling our role as a community. Now I'll be handing it off to Jeff to talk about some of the benefits. Thank you. So when looking at GRA, our team knew that making these changes had to make sense from the perspective of the businesses actually implementing these changes. And as mentioned before, cities all around the world are putting sustainable legislation through um, involving waste management, plastic and styrofoam bans. And as this continues, and cities like South Bend implement their carbon neutral 2050 plan and other cities with plans similar to that, the GRA certification um, prepares restaurants for any legislation that may force restaurants to become more sustainable in the future. The certification can also offer thousands of dollars in savings for the restaurant. The certification averages to a monthly cost of about $55, but the energy and waste management action steps listed within the certification have been shown to save restaurants anywhere from two to $8,000 according to the GRA's website. The Green Restaurant Association also points out that just $2,000 in savings can equate to over $40,000 in new revenue. And that's because with 79% of customers actually preferring to eat at a green restaurant, you're more likely to get new customers coming into your restaurant. So overall, our team just believes that combined with the environmental aspects um, discussed earlier in the presentation, combined with the price benefits, um, GRA offers numerous benefits to local restaurants. And I'll pass it back to Cassidy. Currently, South Bend restaurants do not have a set of green guidelines to abide by. Figureheads such as downtown South Bend members have confirmed that they know little to nothing about what local restaurants and markets are doing to take sustainability initiative. The practices that are incorporated in the GRA certification address food with a systems approach. By the enforcement of sourcing local, profits can increase as customers are attracted to the idea of knowing exactly where their meals come from. Socially forming local partnerships can gain the community's respect as both parties are strength strengthening their, com their economy. This also will create a stronger community of restaurant owners given that this data will be shared and distributed among them. It is evident that enforcing sustainable practices Practices and operations will lessen restaurants' overall impact on climate change. This provide, these provided steps showcase the opportunity for South Bend to take these green initiative steps towards a more sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, team. That was really interesting. Uh, very compelling data and a great vision. I'm excited to see what questions folks might have. They can post on our YouTube chat. We can gather those after the next presentation is done. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking again because you're really here to hear about these, real, these cool projects that the students have been working on. Uh, the next team that's coming up also has some images to share. Uh, and I understand a video as well. Uh, we've got Vanessa, Emily, Ruth, and Caitlin. Hello everyone, my name is Emily Miller and I am a general studies major with a concentration in social and behavioral sciences and I have minors in sociology, anthropology and sustainability studies. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Baines. I'm getting my bachelor's degree in biology with minors in sustainability, chemistry and Spanish. 
Hi, my name is Ruth Bander and I'm doing my graduate certificate in sustainability. I also have um, a master's degree in public affairs. My name is Caitlin. I'm majoring in biology. My minors are in chemistry and biology, uh, sustainability. <laughs> um, our group focused on wetlands and their importance to our environment. All right, so to begin our talk today, I want us all to imagine a world full of biodiversity first, a world full of ecosystems flourishing with different plants and animal species, a world where wetland protection isn't even discussed because not only are they protected, but people are aware of them and their importance. Unfortunately, that is not the case right now as a not a lot of people know about wetlands and what they do, which brings us to our hot topic today of wetlands and why they matter and why they should matter to you. So to begin with, we need to understand what wetlands are and why we really need to care about them. So wetlands are areas as defined by the Environmental Protection Agency, where water is at the level of the soil, covers it either year round or most parts of the year, even including growing seasons. Um, you do have some images on your screen right now, going from left, working our way in the upper right, we have swamps, marshes, fen, uh, bogs and fens. Those are the four major categories. Um, you can sort and categorize wetlands by where they are geographically, what types of plants, animals inhabit them, um, type of soil, nutrients evolved, um, but they all come together for a really important purpose that we'll get to later on. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off um, to the next person now. There are many aspects of the wetland ecosystem in terms of why they're important, the issues surrounding their demise, and the role we play as a society in the terms of securing or threatening their future. I'm, I'm specifically referring to policy we create that imp impacts them. For example, Senate, Indiana Senate Bill 389. So to begin with, let's talk about all the good that wetlands do for us. Um, the major overlaying feature I'm going to talk about is biological productivity. Um, that's basically saying, you know, how productive is this ecosystem? So not only looking at the plants and animals that inhabit it and what they do for the ecosystem and the communities around it, but even down to the microorganisms. So all these other bullet points, I'm going to go through one by one. And these all contribute to how productive this ecosystem is as a whole, not only for our society, um, but really the entire world in general. So let's start with water storage infiltration. So a really key function of wetlands is recharging groundwater supplies um, and even moderating the flow of streams, um, rivers, and the like. Next, we're going on to purification. So in a watershed, it's really important that we have clean water, controlling water control um, and quality, and that's what helps that. Next, they also are key in flood protection. So not only do they help reduce the damage caused by floods by both absorbing, storing, and slowing the flow of water if it does happen to get past them, it also creates an area um, afterwards where um, wildlife is more likely to return to. Next, we have food, uh, food security. So not only food for the plants, animals, microorganisms that live there, but also people as well. So according to the World Wildlife Fund, um, wetlands also provide an agricultural, uh, agricultural value, but the cultivation of rice, um, this is a staple in a majority of the country's diet and even the world's uh, diet. So it helps us as well as the animals and plants that inhabit it. Speaking of habitation, we're looking at animals threatened by human encroachment. Um, according to the Environmental, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, more than a third of the species that live in wetlands only live in wetlands. So they're incredibly essential to a large portion of species. They're also um, really important for migratory birds. So these offer areas of rest. They offer the ability for them to uh, breed, nest, even rear their young um, in a safe environment and allow them to socialize with other birds in the area, which is also really key for their health and well-being. 
And finally, we have the recreation capabilities of uh, the ecosystem as a whole. So this allows people in the communities locally, nationally, and the like to really see the beauty of how wetlands work and how you can actually be a more integral part of your own um, local wetland. They offer activities such as kayaking, canoeing, fishing, hiking, biking, um, and even watching those birds we mentioned about. So let's look at the bad side. The bad side is the decay of wetlands or the destructions that wetlands are facing. So approximately 35% of the world's wetlands were lost between 1970s and 1915. As of now in 2021, it's believed that more than 50% of wetlands have been lost in the past 100 years. So what is the major cause of wetland destructions? The first one is believed to be mostly human activities. Human activities have actually caused uh, the changing water quality, the quantity of uh, water and the flow rates, also increasing pollutants inputs into these wetlands has actually caused them to be uh, destroyed. Agriculture is one of those destructions that have actually been made on those wetlands because the soil normally has nutrition that boost most of the crops on the soils or on on the fields that have uh, agricultural practices. At the same time, we are, uh, wetlands are facing climate change. The climate change is one of the major causes and this change is actually the natural cause. So we're looking at things such as floods, cyclones, and as well as droughts and fire. All these natural causes can be a major threat to wetlands and that have actually caused a destruction of wetlands over the past 100 years and also they are the threat of these natural causes. So what are the effects of this destructions. These destructions actually are causing an increase in floods, drought, as well as nutrient runoff on soils, water pollution. We also have decline in wildlife uh, pollution. We are going to look at the agri side. The agri side is that the Senate Bill 381. So the Senate Bill just aims to remove the permit process that is needed to build on isolated wetlands. As of the, this year in February, there was um, a, this bill passed the General Assembly and uh, it awaits the governor's signature to make it go into the law. So normally what this bill is actually authorizing is that it's going to eliminate the protection of class one wetlands as well as class two wetlands. That means wetlands are no longer going to have uh, protection on them and the people who are into development can actually go there and develop them. As well as at the same time, uh, the homeowners are actually against this bill as compared to the developers on the, uh, that are on the land. So on the wetland now, most of the time, these people, developers are looking to carry along agricultural activities or just building infrastructures that will that will bring them profits and forgetting about the importance of wetlands. So where do we go from here? So we know wetlands are important. We've seen the various benefits. We've also seen how they're in danger. So first we have to start small. So as our group decided, we decided to focus on the IOSB wetlands. We are lucky enough to have two wetlands on our campus. Um, and we decided that knowledge is key. So um, a survey was done by our very own Professor Bailey um, last year that demonstrated that less than 50% of the people that took the survey knew what wetlands were or even their function. Um, so you can be able to help promote the growth and function of wetlands really starts with knowing what they are. Um, so not only educating people about what they are, also working on our wetlands um, by introducing native species and removing invasive species uh, to make sure they grow and are doing well. Um, and really our short-term vision overall was to change, um, create change for individuals in our local communities. So they're becoming an active part of the wetland ecosystem or at least stopping their own degradation of it. So now we're looking at our big picture. Where do we see, you know, five, 10, 20, 
30, 50, 100 years from now. Um, obviously, this is just a start, but our goal was, of course, to get the IUSB wetlands in a good, proper shape, make sure they're flourishing. Then we're going to look at statewide, nationwide, worldwide wetland ecosystems and be sure that they're doing the same thing that we were able to demonstrate here locally. Um, and from there, our huge overlying compelling vision that we see for the whole project um, is really just to create a clean, biodiverse, and healthy future for all, um, one ecosystem at a time. Awesome, yes. But just like Caitlin was saying, to get to this big compelling vision, we have to start small, which our group did. So our group obviously focused our presentation and project around wetlands, specifically looking at our local campus wetlands. So to begin this project, we had to understand a couple things. First, looking at what we as individuals and group members knew about wetlands ourselves, which was um, nothing in the beginning. But after reading... Oh, what was that noise? I don't know. I'm sorry if you hear that. I don't know what it is. Um, anyways, um, but looking at the library is going to close in 15 minutes in case you guys were wondering. Okay, anyways, moving on. What we knew about wetlands, so kind of our baseline um, data surrounding that. So after learning, um, and reading articles about wetlands from the wet, um, World Wildlife Fund and also the Environmental Protection Agency and also our own personal tour from Dr. Mar herself um, on the local IUSB wetlands. We were given a knowledge surrounding not only global wetlands but also our local wetlands and what they provide for the community. But um, knowing this, uh, we had to ask ourselves how we could spread this to the community. So as Caitlin mentioned, we were given a survey from Professor Bailey given the knowledge that our community members knew about wetlands, which was also very slim. Um, so this created a wonderful opportunity for us to not only spread our awareness to people who know nothing about wetlands, but also to people who may not understand um, what they mean to our community. And um, after gathering our information, we had to ask ourselves, how can we create this change in not only an interesting way, but in a way that relays a big amount of information um, to a group of people who want to know about them. So how conveniently, uh, every year, IUSB hosts an Earth and Arbor Day event in which uh, community members are able to come and remove invasive species and plant native species. So last Friday on Earth Day, um, Volunteers came to the Veterans Memorial Park to uh, plant native species and this coming Friday and Saturday volunteers will be working on the wetlands themselves specifically removing a bunch of invasive species. So to create this conversation for change and create awareness about the wetlands. This was a key event in our project because we were given the opportunity to share our knowledge that we acquired and create a presentation video that was going to be dispersed to the volunteers that would be working on the wetlands themselves. So this is key because not only are the volunteers community members who probably care about the environment, but this event also holds a huge motivation factor because as we're coming near the end of the semester, people need those service hours. And if you're part of the honors program, it also counts as an event. Um, so it's pulling together people who care about the environment and also people who may not realize that they should care about the environment. And then also as um, we're creating this video and it's being dispersed to these volunteers and they're watching it and then going to the wetlands themselves and working on the project, they're probably more in in they're more inclined to spread their tales of the wetlands and this will create the conversation for change and an opportunity to spread awareness. So our little project in the works, this is the video that we created. So Vanessa, your audio is not working. You'll need to adjust your sharing to allow the audio to go through. All right. Do we know how to do that? 
I posted in the chat to you some instructions. Pretty soon. Oh, chat instructions. Okay. Share, 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 Unfortunately, I and technologically not advanced. Where is the bottom left corner and where is this option? Audio settings? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, sure time. Ha ha, I got it. Okay, let's try this again. Hello, everyone. We just wanted to start by saying thank you for participating in this Earth Day event. My name is Emily, and I'm here with Ruth, Vanessa, and Caitlin. We are all sustainability students at IUSB, and we're going to educate you about wetlands and why your work matters. So firstly, what are wetlands? As defined by the Environmental Protection Agency, wetlands are areas where water covers the soil or is present either at or near the surface of the soil all year or for varying periods of time during the year, even including growing seasons. There are four different types of wetlands going from left to right. We have marshes, swamps, bogs, and fens, and they all tie in to an overall importance for wetlands. The key importance for wetlands include water storage, for example, storing and also slowing floodwaters during flooding seasons, water filtration, biological productivity, providing habitats for various species of fish and birds that might otherwise not have a place to go, especially during migratory seasons, as well as erosion control. So wetland on campus, we have two wetlands on campus, the east and the west wetland are syndicated in the area photograph area A and area B. These wetlands are located on the community housing hostels and they are maintained by the biology department. Both of these wetlands would get floods and also invasive are plants that would usually come and grow in these wetlands. So after these, I'll talk about the importance of these wetlands on campus. The USB wetland matters. They usually filter water in the St. Joe River biodiversity. We have birds of different species, amphibians, and pollinators such as bees that give fertilization to the native plants that are located on these wetlands. So as you can see from this video, this is a panorama of the west side wetland on campus. As you can see, it's kind of dead right now due to the winter months, but as spring continues and summer arrives, these different plants will flourish and this dead wetland will become a beautiful scenery for the different native species that will come to it. Moving on from the west side wetland, we have the east side wetland. So this is also looking pretty dead right now, but as summer continues to come, this will become a beautiful area for different species. So as volunteers on the Arbor Day Earth Day event, you will be pulling different invasive species that are on these different wetlands, specifically looking at the purple loose stripe, the Phragmites common reed, and then also various young woody plants such as cottonwood, willow, and sumac <clears throat> As you're out there removing invasive species, remember how important your role is to this community. Wetlands everywhere are so important, but the future biodiversity of our wetlands on campus is possible due to your hard work. As a community, we thank you for your service and dedication. Hello, everyone. We just wanted to start by saying. So what will it cost? Um, you can look at this in two ways. The first way is the, what we have to sacrifice to put our thoughts into action. For example, those pulling invasive species from the wetlands are volunteering their time to physically remove the invasive species, but also taking time to educate themselves about the wetland before the event. IOSB is providing tools for the volunteers as well as in meals, so that kind of counts towards the money side of things. The second way to look at this is what it will cost us if we don't take action. We cannot stress enough just how important wetlands are. Without wetlands, we'd lose benefits they offer like water purification, erosion protection, and wildlife that live there. For our campus specifically, our wetlands help protect student housing when the river rises. In a broader sense though, the benefits, of wetlands pro the benefits that wetlands provide are ultimately priceless. 
Looking forward, uh, one thing we try to emphasize in our video was that the work that the volunteers were doing is very much appreciated. Maintaining our wetlands is a continuous battle, so much so that there are local and even global organizations whose main objective is to conserve and maintain wetlands. Perhaps the most important part of this project was the ability to gain knowledge about wetlands and then the ability to share this knowledge with others to create a better environment for everyone. All righty. Thank you so much. I think we've all just learned so much about wetlands if we didn't already know, which maybe we didn't. Uh, so at this time, uh, I want to open it up for questions. I know I've got at least one that is posted live on our YouTube channel. So if you folks can uh, put your questions there and I'll be asking them to the groups. I know I've got questions. Uh, to ask uh, for some clarification and just because I got really curious about some of these topics and next steps. Uh, so that said, uh, I'll start with the uh, first question from uh, our viewers and that is uh, for the Green Restaurant uh, Project Group uh, and I'm not sure who wants to, to take this one but they're curious if um, green restaurant certifications is mostly of interest to independently owned restaurants or are there chains that are pursuing this cert certification? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. And so the GRA, it's more, um, it, it goes to change your, your operations as a business. So it usually is on an individual restaurant basis. The most um, widespread thing I think is, the, um, which is good is the new partnership they have with Grubhub. That's almost like a universal thing that a lot of different restaurants can uh, do to um, shift things in that direction. Um, I believe my group did uh, some more research and found that uh, Dunkin Donuts is, um, their chain is actually um, certified within uh, the GRA. So, um, so that, that, that's a major thing, but uh, I think it, the GRA more uh, suits individual businesses that have the, um, the ability and authority to make those uh, big changes at their restaurant. With change, it gets kind of tricky uh, to do that. But apparently people should follow the lead of Dunkin' Donuts. I did not realize yeah, that. Much. So if you want like the most sustainable donut, that's where you're supposed to go. <laughs> that's pretty great. <laughs> I would like to just clarify real quick He's right with the Dunkin' Donuts, but they actually have their own version of a green restaurant certification, like proprietary to Dunkin' Donuts, that focuses on mainly energy, which is why we focused on the Green Restaurant Association, because they have a much more in-depth look at the restaurant's operations. Interesting. So GRA takes more of a holistic systems approach, but Dunkin' Donuts was really looking at energy efficiency, which I suppose makes sense because they're going to get some good return on that investment right away by making donuts more efficiently. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I know we've got another question and I believe Mary is going to ask the other question that has come in about uh, for this group. And then I've got one for the wetlands group. I just want to say to both groups, nice job. Um, I enjoyed listening to both and I learned uh, a lot in both presentations. So nice job all across the board. Um, be proud of yourselves. Um, I have a question regarding the green restaurant group. Um, I understand that there's a, a, an up to 40,000, there can be a $40,000 uh, increased revenue once you're certified. Did you guys come across any um, numbers on how much a, a restaurant needs to spend in order to get certified with the training of the employees and, and the conversion of these storage containers and stuff like that. Was there a, a, an amount that you guys came across? I have a few numbers. Um, as Jeff had mentioned, it's $55 on average. It can depend because each individual employee, um, it's a $20 certification. So just depend on how many employees they had and then the certification, they don't really have a set number. So just really depend on the operation of the business, how big the business is. Um, let's, for example, Chicory Cafe, if anyone is familiar with that restaurant, they have a lot of sustainable practices in place, um, but it just looks individually at a restaurant. So like if they wanted to get both of them 
both of them, um, even though they're the same restaurant, if they wanted to get both of them certified, they would have different averages of to keep the certification up just because they're individual. Yeah, $55. Short answer, but I just wanted to explain because I looked into that too. I wish I would have had more access to like a range, but it's, it, that's the only information that we were given from the website. Okay, thank you. So the wetlands group also had a question posted for you. Uh, so we'll turn to that. What does it say? Oh. So this is about our campus wetlands. Uh, do you know, does IU see any financial benefit in taking care of the campus wetlands? Obviously that's a concern for any, any operation and a campus is no different. Um, like, do they see any financial benefits um, like maybe in flood protection to IU owned structures? So the wetlands on campus, or at least one of them, actually serves as a retention pond, and I say pond lately, um, a retention pond um, in case of flooding of the St. Joe River. So the housing on campus is more protected. Um, as far as other uh, benefits financially, um, it's, I can't give you a number as to how that's helping us, but I can give you um, kind of I can pose a question back, you know, if we if we didn't spend the time and resources to sustain them, would it be worth kind of like Emily mentioned, the loss of all those benefits that we have to not only um, our community, the campus as a whole, um, and just the environment in general. Thanks, yeah, and thanks for the person asking the question because obviously that's very important if we're going to protect and save wetlands are we going to be losing money by doing so? Um, I am. I know we're wrapping up your projects, but it would be interesting for the university to consider the savings that they've gotten from those wetlands. I remember a few years ago when we were evacuating students from student housing because the flooding was so high, it came within very close of one of the buildings. Um, but I suspect without the wetlands, that might have been a different story. We would have lost a lot of money on the repairs and the, the structures that could have been damaged by those floods. So interesting point. Did you have a question to share too, Mary? Played I touched. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, can we talk about, um, am I still muted? No. Can we talk about constructed wetlands? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know they're not able to treat um, modern um, wastewater. Did you guys come across any controversy on that? Not controversy um, with treating wastewater, but like constructed wetlands um, in the first place, like that's kind of what Senator 389 was kind of, they were kind of removing that aspect and like um, reconstructing a wetland after you take away a wetland. So um, obviously constructed wetlands, natural wetlands are all important because they're providing a habitat and um, a resource for all sorts of aspects for the ecosystem. But in terms, uh, in terms of like, wasteland and just like uh, that stuff. I didn't read anything about that. I don't know if my group members did, but that wasn't also, that wasn't in our white paper either. So I don't think we touched base on that, but all wetlands matter. How about diseases? Anything? Okay. Good question. And that is a concern that people have with wetlands is that they'll breed mosquitoes and carry disease and that kind of thing. But uh, I'm sure the group found in their learning about wetlands that a healthy wetland does not contribute uh, to that. So they operate well in balance with all the influences around them. I do have one uh, personal question of my own as we wait to see if any others get posted or if anybody else in class has questions for the other group. Um, but I would like to ask one question. Uh, let's see, I think mine got answered for the wetland group, uh, but for the restaurant group, I was curious, um, you talked a lot about 
um, how communities had been able to pursue their green restaurant certification, um, leveraged in part by city bans on styrofoam use, for example. However, in Indiana, cities aren't allowed to ban things like that. Um, this has been in place for a number of years since um, the city of Bloomington wanted to ban plastic bags. And then the state of Indiana said, no, cities can't ban that. Uh, and we can't set up those municipal bans. So given our reality in Indiana, what do you recommend to local restaurants in terms of um, opportunities to leverage some of these changes since they can't push for a municipal ban? What ban, what can, what can we do here for, in terms of local restaurants and, and looking at using or not using some of those items? Can I also piggyback on what the professors, I know I brought this up in other classes, but can we as consumers bring in our own take home container? To answer Mary, yeah, to answer Mary's questions, I would say yes. I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And as for the legislation um, specific to like recycling, well, specific to the styrofoam, the plastic, we think that despite the lack of legislation in Indiana um, to, for the cities, the by not using the, the plastic or the styrofoam, the restaurants will be able to differentiate themselves from other businesses that do use that. So the customers that do, do care about um, those kind, kinds of things will appreciate that and will attract more customers to your business. But there's also the case that we aren't 100% sure that there will never be any legislation within Indiana to ban recycling or to ban um, styrofoam and plastics. So the restaurants could still prepare themselves for any future legislation that may come. Great point, thanks. And that's uh, a, a big part of, uh, I'm kind of proud now in terms of sustainability teaching because that's something that we want to avoid, right? Is, is risk management and avoiding those things that you know it's gonna come. We're gonna have to put a ban on some of this trashy, wasteful, polluting stuff. Um, so why not get ahead of the curve? So, thank you for that. Wasn't really looking for that, but I was just curious, like what can we do? Um, I'm gonna take a last look for any questions, but as I do, are there questions in the class for the class about your projects? I guess I'll go ahead and I'll break the ice for the, um, restaurant certification group. So this is just kind of like a broad feeling, feeling question. Um, when you guys were looking at the um, certification, what examples were most notable to you individually um, or even cities or what are some really good examples of how restaurants kind of turn themselves around or really use this to their advantage? Within the standards, you can earn points um, and they range. So depending on, let's say if you were to, with like the energy sector, if you were to change like your light bulbs, you wouldn't earn as many points like to energy efficient light bulbs. But if you were to go like full solar, that would get you ahead. Um, so I just found that interesting with the range of things you can earn points on because there's a great list of things. So I found that interesting. Um, yeah, and then I also had a question for the wetland group, I guess. Um, you guys mentioned like the invasive species removal, like on campus and stuff, and like talked about purple loose strife. But uh, was there any other like heavily prevalent invasives? And then also, um, what was either your removal method or what was being done? Like, were any um, herbicides used, or was it just um, direct uh, removal with no um, chemicals or herbicides or anything like that? 
So on our tour with Dr. Mar, so she um, pointed out three main uh, invasive species that the volunteers themselves would be pulling that day. So that's what she discussed. And I think that's all that they're going to touch. And she even mentioned like the woody seedlings, like that's just gonna be dependent on weather, like whatever the weather is like this weekend. And in terms of removing the invasive species, I don't think any herbicide is going to be used. Um, I know in the past when I volunteered at the Earth Day event, when they removed invasive species, it was all hand physical work. And also like they provide like shovels and like um, tiny little rakes and whatever, whatever uh, you can physically remove the plants. But no, I don't think any chemicals were used as that's probably going to be very uh, dangerous to the organisms that they're trying to create a home for. I also had a question for the wetlands group. Do any of you, well, I don't really know any updates, but do you have any insight on the current stance of the bill now that it's to the governor or anything like that? When I looked at it last, it the speaker had signed it. And then I looked at how government works because I don't understand law and legislation. And I was like, is speaker under go governor? I don't know. I don't know. Do we have a speaker? I didn't realize that, but whoever the speaker is, the speaker signed it. Um, but as of right now, I'm pretty sure it's favorable to pass. Unless someone has any other update on that. So it has gone, uh, been passed through the legislature. It is um, on the governor's desk right now, uh, waiting for him to either veto uh, or ignore or sign it. Uh, there is actually, uh, there's a big thing in the local newspaper in the South Bend Tribune saying uh, groups are rallying to pressure the governor to not sign it, to, to veto it. Uh, so there is still actually a very widespread collaborative group of environmental activists from across the state that are lobbying the governor to veto the bill even though it has been distilled from its original format to be not quite as um, uh, allowing of wetland removal, there's, uh, there's pressure for him to, to veto the bill. So we'll have to see what happens. There's still time to act and to contact the governor. Uh, so that, that's where I know that it's at, but it sh should be ha something happening pretty soon with that. I guess to follow along on that, I was wondering if you guys and what you'd learned about wetlands, um, obviously people are gonna go out and be working in the wetlands on campus, but is there anything that uh, maybe you've been inspired or maybe that you would recommend for us to do? What, do we, what should we know or do about wetlands to, to continue uh, along with you know, the intent of your project to kind of teach us about them and, and care about them? Uh, what would you recommend, you, you know, we should do, or what's something you're going to do next? Hello. Okay, so when I was reading about, I'm sorry, I'm like outside the library now because I closed. Okay, um, when I was reading about what local organizations were doing about wetlands, there was a student, actually like an 11 year old boy who created a petition so petitions are always great, I think, but um, service events like stuff that's happening on campus, I think those are the most um, important things, especially on a local level, not only educating people on like the importance, but actually getting out there and working and sustaining wetlands yourself. It's also important to understand what native species are and how they um, impact the ecosystem. I know uh, grass is pretty and lawns, are nice, but planting native species in your yards are uh, also important. So looking at all aspects of the ecosystem, but I think that's what that's what I would do in terms of sustaining wetlands. Yeah, so kind of picking off of Vanessa. Um, it's a bit difficult unless you have a, a wetland in your backyard um, to really quickly can I have, oh, I can immediately go into action, but what you can do. Um, so now you know we have wetlands on campus. You can get involved with Dr. Marr, Dr. Schnabel, um, Professor Bailey, anybody really 
um, who works with the wetlands or know about them, um, I think kind of faculty professor wise would be more than happy to um, have you go out with them. They could teach you, actually show you, okay, this is native, this is invasive, um, here are the problems that they pose. So that would be a really great option. I think moving further than that, um, just looking around at different, uh, different parks or um, areas that we have locally um, to really get involved. So I know there's a bunch of um, park rangers and uh, people that work for the park system that would be more than happy to have a conversation with anybody interested. Um, so again, reaching out to those people um, and kind of posing those questions, you know, you've worked around this for, for how long? Could you share some of the expertise with me? And um, going with that, I think I'm gonna piggyback off Vanessa. Um, even if you do have a garden or I know spring is here, everyone's looking at flowers to get Mother's Day's coming up. Um, maybe pick mama a really nice native plant um, that will last her, you know, for years to come and isn't going to, you know, pose an issue for um, plants in the future. That sounds like a great uh, note to end our live stream on. So I want to thank folks uh, for watching and joining us on YouTube. Uh, but the class can hang on for a little bit longer. Uh, but thanks everybody for presenting these insightful uh, and interesting projects for us and look forward to seeing what uh, viewers and others will do with this moving forward as well as, as well work it will do.